Welcome to Debate Night, everybody. We are back once again with another episode. We got a great show today. But before we get into anything, I got to tell you about something pretty special coming up this Friday. Okay. If you haven't heard about it, if you haven't seen any of our other social platforms, we've got a pretty awesome thing, a drop that we haven't had a drop like this, a custom run drop in years. And we're bringing it back. We've got a very special disc. Let me get it right in the middle of the frame. Look at that. Wow. This is a Dark Horse Ace of Thorns. Oh, that's crazy. Zone. Yeah, this is a Jawbreaker ESP Flex Zone, and it's not just a disc you buy. That's not what makes this so special. Basically, you know, buy one, buy a couple, but then film yourself getting an ace. Um, so the more you get, the more opportunities you have per hole to get an ace. Um, and then you, you're going to post that ace, tag Discraft and Foundation, and we're going to pick the top five aces. All five of them are going to win a prize, but then the people are going to vote on those top five aces, and the winner is going to get a grand prize, which is going to be a brand new grip bag. I don't even think we've announced this yet, so this is exciting. It's going to be a brand new grip bag full of all kinds of discs and accessories from Foundation. Uh, Discraft is, is providing the grip bag, so it's an awesome collaboration. It's dropping this Friday, foundationdisc.com at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're going to want to get in on this. It's going to be a lot of fun to see what kind of aces people can produce. So make sure to check that out. Had to plug that real quick. Can I Let pick the... one of the winners. I would like to pick one dark horse winner. Yeah. I know you guys are all going to pick like the coolest ones. We'll pick our four. You pick your one. I'm going to pick one dark horse Love one. It. So if you're out there thinking there's no chance that I could win, I'm not very good. I might get the dark horse pick. Dark horse. Okay. Pick. Brody it. has a dark horse pick. Um, all right. Well, Brody's here. He's introduced himself. Yeah. Via dark horse pick. You know, first thing I want to say is um, unless you have a shirt that literally says man of the people with your face on it, you can no longer claim yourself man of the people. I, that word's getting thrown around quite often now. Uh, stop it immediately. Second okay. thing, comments from last episode. Uh, it seemed like my housing market, that was actually a good analogy. It was great. Sometimes, you know, these things <laughs> pop in my head and I just fly with it. And sometimes they're terrible. That one apparently yeah. was pretty good. People liked it. Uh, people were concerned that Brad didn't know what show he was on. Uh, didn't realize it was actually supposed to be a debate. And uh, <laughs> another, whoever this guy is, Trevor, please get this guy on the show because he would be perfect because okay. I would rip him to shreds. He said, uh, in quotes, putting should be harder. Also in quotes, baskets should catch putts. Same people. So he's basically coming at us for saying that putting should be harder, but also saying baskets should catch you can have both. What is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Gary is back, uh, back on the show, looking to get a win. I think, was it last time you were on the show that you lost? Yeah. Hunt, Hunter has become a new nemesis of mine since I haven't seen Rich uh, Tumbleweed going across the screen in a while. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, nope. Just happy to be here. And uh, the ace run, the ace race, that sounds like a lot of fun. I think everyone should comment what course and what hole you're going to get your ace at. That'd be kind of fun. Yes. Yes, they should. Do I get an ace this week at Des Moines with the disc? That would be that such would a be blessing incredible. from above. Do it <laughs> in the insane. first round, and hopefully you have an early tee time, and get that over to me stat. Yeah. That's Unfortunately, be there's pick. probably like only a handful of holes, like maybe two that I can think of that is even possible to ace with that. But who knows? We'll that would be electric. I'll force it. I'll yeah. force it for the content. <laughs> You're throwing on like half the tees. You're like, I got it. I'm stepping up 450 court. feet. Doesn't matter. Straight into a headwind. What is he pulling? <laughs> what is Dark Horse Ace? Also, did we miss the ball real quick? Should we have called it the Ace of Zone? Or is that a dumb idea? That no. just popped. Ace of Thon's fine. I don't mind it, but All Ace right. of Thon tells more what it is. Okay, fair um, enough. Fair enough. All right, Hunter, you're here as well. I like that I hat, am. man. Thank you. Shout out Oak Grove. I also have my name on a shirt. Um, Somewhat. Uh, I also have my notes here. <laughs> Nothing. Busy day today. Getting get notes done, so I'm going off the dome. Last time I went off the dome, I won. So we'll see. Mm, it's gonna be an interesting yeah. show then. Notless Hunter could be the new standing Brody. People are saying it. Wow. We're saying it right here. The conversation's happening. Uh and then Ryan's also joining. It's been a while since we had Ryan on the show. He's back. Yeah. yeah. Is that a team uh, Lone Star hat, Ryan? <laughs> it is. I am oh, one of man. <laughs> He's I was wearing it proudly. What was that laugh at the beginning? I am. I am wearing it proudly. You know what? Uh, like uh, local Maryland pro. I'm. I'm happy. To, it, it's fun. It's fun to to have that team atmosphere. I miss it. You know, being out of 
high school and college sports for a while. So it's nice to have a team, but hey, sometimes we're you know, team. say what you want. I, I, I enjoy being on them. They've done nothing, nothing but awesome stuff for me personally. So is I only speak for myself. Ranger team or you're on the legit team. No, I'm I'm on the team above. I'm, okay, I'm on the team. Oh, okay. Never mind then. Never mind. Yeah, that's, okay. that's oh, way I'll cool. Take back everything. I take I, it all back. All right, cool, cool. cool. Yeah, I thought you're rocking no, the no, Ranger I'm, I'm team, the team, and I was like, dang, dude. Yeah. Okay, no, I respect no, that. No, Blink twice if I you're okay, Ryan. Blink twice <laughs> if you're okay. <laughs> so I, I was I was worried about just getting all the flack here, but I'm I, I appreciate I've slightly redeemed myself. Yeah, uh, no, for that. But no, I for for real they been awesome yeah, I, I enjoy being on the team all right well, uh, but no maybe... it's it's good to be back i'm happy to be back two tiny humans kept me uh from a couple couple of shows before but i'm i'm here i'm ready all right maybe lone star will send you a bonus for that plug they, <laughs> they, they are there. <laughs> yeah um all right we're gonna get into our first topic here so we, we recently had the swedish open notably a uh, bit of a showdown between james proctor and paul Macbeth and others so we want to know has paul blown his best chance to get a win this season you know we talked a lot about that streak that ricky has paul needing to exp- extend his streak to basically ever have a chance of breaking that record i doubt he would reset the streak at this point um has he blown his best chance to get a win this season at the swedish open and do you buy into the idea that he's still improving since his injury or is the Paul we see now the Paul we've got for good? Because I think there are people on both sides of the fence right now, but it's like, how long do you hold out this idea that he is still getting better and trying to work back to what he was, wherever that lands him? Brody, what do you think? Yeah. So looking at the schedule he has left, I mean, I think you can make a real argument that the Swedish Open probably was a great opportunity for him to win. Um, But does that mean that he doesn't have a chance of winning later in the season? Absolutely not. So I I would agree that probably was his best chance just with all the factors that were going into play. But I still like him. European Open. If it wasn't for Eagle, he wins that tournament by double digits. If you don't, don't forget he plays very, very well out there. He's going to have two more European events at the Crock Hole and the European Disc Golf Fe- Festival, which are going to be very uh, limited fields as well. Um, another course he plays really good at, Worlds, the one that he designed. So look for him to do well there. And then Deglo, also one of the courses that he plays really well at as well. So I, I think he has a lot of potential to still pick up maybe a win. Uh, would I bet that he would? No, I don't think that, you know, I think his odds of winning a tournament would probably be like, what, probably plus 1,200 maybe, something like that, maybe in that range. So odds are probably favoring no. And uh, is this the Paul? I mean, without us asking him, it's very hard to tell. Um, if he came out and was saying something along the lines of like, hey, I haven't really been practicing that much, then maybe that leads to me to think that maybe there is a little bit more there. Um, but I, I'm thinking that probably if I had gun in my head, this is probably the Paul we're going to get. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, it's tough to say like how long you kind of waited out before you settle on that. Um, Gary, what do you think about, uh, Paul's chances as we move on to extend that streak and where he's at? Yeah, it's, it's definitely not been the most stellar year for Paul so far. You know, I'm willing to concede that this was his best chance for a win to date. Um, I think there are a lot of events left in the year, like Brody said, and it feels a little bit unfair to discount both the history and determination that the McBeast has shown us. Um, And he said before that he likes to peak around the majors. He kind of prepares himself for those. And we've witnessed glimpses of the six time Paul this year, but we're, we're not getting it for a long enough stretch to get the win. I mean, you can't go even on the front nine and then eight down on the back nine. You got to pull that together for the entire round. I'm not willing to count him out if he's healthy and he's playing, Speaking of healthy, though, I mean, I think he's definitely still trying to improve, but it's not there yet. Uh, The putt does not look very good, and he's going on long stretches of holes that are uncharacteristic for what we've grown to be used to with Paul. The biggest indicator for me would be to look at his stats from last year to this year because stats don't really care about field strength. It's just straight up what he's doing, and if you look, his birdie rate is down 10%. His park percentage is down 3%. His C1 and C2 in regulation are down 7%. His scramble rate is down 26%. His C1X is down 2%. His C2 putts are down 8%. And he's playing on courses that haven't dramatically changed. Uh, so to me, those stats mean one of two things. Either you've got a player who is trying to get back to where they once were, or you have a player who is falling away from the greatness that we all used to know. And for Paul, I think it's a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely some some alarming stats and some gap to bridge still there. Um, Hunter, how are you looking at things for Paul, and where do you see them going this season? Yeah, I think it's definitely an interesting, interesting situation. Um, the Swedish Open statistically will probably have been when we get to the end of the season his best chance to win. I think his next best statistically, if we don't factor in the Paul effect of just courses he's really comfortable with, will probably be the European Disc Golf Festival. Registration wise, that doesn't look like it's true. I'm just curious how many players play the European Open and then decide I'm heading back. I'm not staying the extra week because Ledgestone starts August 1st. The European Festival ends the week right before that. So I could see some players dropping out of that. I don't know. But regardless, like let's just take a look at what this is, right? All season, there was a stretch where we thought he's getting better, he's becoming more consistent. But if you look at his season as a whole, that's actually not the true story because he came out of the gates 52nd, 64th, picked up a little steam, 22nd. Okay, now 57th at Jonesboro. That's weird. Second, 10th. That's the stretch. Music City Champions Cup. We're like, oh, he's picking up some steam. He's doing good. 27th at DDO, 18th at OTB. Okay, yeah, there it is. There's the stretch. 7th at Portland. All checks out. But then he rattles off a 43rd, 53rd. And then second here, I think if you look at the season as a whole and you don't look at the stretch in the middle, it just points to an inconsistency where he has the greatness inside, right? We know what Paul's capable of. That player is still there. And I think that when he gets on certain runs, he can be at the top, which means it doesn't matter what field he's in. He can still win certain events. But I think to expect up and down, also not an excuse, but we, a lot of us are parents here. If a newborn baby keeps you up at 2 a.m., there's only so much you can do. <laughs> fair enough fair enough how, how long do we do we get the uh the newborn excuse though that's the question I'm two years in and my son is keeping me up at like two hours in the middle of every night so i mean <laughs> it got Same a few here. years at least um you gotta talk to scotty scheffler that's true yeah <laughs> it doesn't seem to bother him i mean that he probably has a nanny maybe that's a, it's a different level there's levels to this game all right ryan wrap it up for us a lot of thoughts so far on on the paul situation seems like a consensus but what do you have to add Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I take this question two ways. Has Paul blown his chance? No, I don't think so. I I definitely think he has some left in the tank. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Was this the best course? Probably, but uh, I think Paul has gotten to the point where he is just like so many other MPO players that any week could be his week. He just needs to put it all together. Uh, we've seen it, as Hunter stated, second at Music City, seventh at Portland. He, he started to rattle off some there. Um, is he recovering? I think this is a big question that not a lot of people covered on. Yes, I, I, I really do think he is. Um, maybe not as much physically, but but mentally. Uh, when you have sport athletes, the sport psychology behind your sport, it, it can sometimes take months to overcome that challenge of, of feeling yourself, becoming yourself. And I think Paul's talked about it multiple times uh, in different platforms of him still trying to feel out his shot. And he's finally starting to feel like he can throw the shots that he wants to. Uh, when you do a specific sport like pitching or golf, a uh, driving golf, right? It, you, it has to be a perfect motion. And I think disc golf's no different. I think Paul's still trying to get into that swing of things, no pun intended. Um, I, I do think he's still a little bit hurt, uh, maybe physically, but I think it is more mentally. Can he win? Yeah, I think he can. There's a couple more spots like other analysts mentioned, but it might have been his best shot to win here. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when it comes to uh, somebody like Paul, who's who's recovering from injury or potentially, um, you know, there's mental hurdles as well. It is just trying to absorb, you know, Hunter mentioned, if you look at his season as a whole, you see a player that is very common on the pro tour now, which is capable of threatening for the win, you know, multiple times in a season, but then there's that inconsistency. It's really hard. There's only a couple players, really like a couple that you can expect to not have drop-offs many times throughout the season. So it just comes down to, you know, when are people just going to be like, okay, this is just the reality we had. This is the player we're looking at now versus expecting them to get back to their former self, whatever that might look like. Now it's, it's a tricky thing, especially when you have players that do start to age a little bit more and, uh, and deal with injuries and, and who knows what, what could be going on there. But um, let's move on to our next topic here. This is a fan submitted topic. We have a few of those uh, this week. So Silva Sarnan is on an absolute tear right now. She has now won five straight consecutive silver or higher events, approaching Paige Pierce's record of seven. 
Just how impressive is this streak, and are you rooting for her to take down the record considering she has done it mostly among weakened fields? I know some people kind of get protective over these records because they don't want to see them fall to something they feel isn't as good of a run. Um, that happens a lot in disc golf with the, just the changing landscapes, I feel like. Uh, Gary, what are your thoughts? I can't wait to see uh, Hunter put a value on the silver events because if you know, you know. Um, but all jokes aside, I think it's really easy to sit back and say things like, you know, hey, we're including silver events here or they're just European events or, you know, it's got a weaker field. But we have to step back even further out and look at the larger picture. Silva is only 21 years old with proven success in the Europe market uh, and the run she is on this year is much greater than anyone realizes you know she came out slow with a 34th finish at u.s women's she made improvements she got to 23rd at texas states you know in a full field then she found her first top 10 at jonesboro in a full field she improved to ninth place at music city in a full field and then she cracked her top five with a fourth place finish at champions cup in a full field she went back to europe took third place at copenhagen and she's been on five straight silver better wins three of which she took down the likes of henna evelina Heidi Lani and Ella Hansen. So she's had competition in some of these events that have pushed her to the end. Um, she has literally not finished worse in any next event that she has in the previous entire season, which I don't think she'll keep that streak up forever, but it's extremely impressive. And am I rooting for her to break the record? You're not a disc golf fan if you're not rooting for her to break this record because what we're seeing is the birth of another European powerhouse. Um, it's going to strengthen the field. It's going to bring more eyes to the FBO. It's going to grow the sport. So I'm going to ask, how can you possibly be a fan of disc golf and not be rooting for her to break this record? All right, strong position from Gary. As per usual, defending the European game. Um, Hunter, any counter to that? No. No, no counter at all. I think obviously, you know, you have the silver event, you know, where I stand on silver events, you add it into European silver event. So the field is weaker, but here's the deal. They, the silver event is a part of the record. When you say Paige Pierce won seven, it's seven DGPT and silver events. So silver events and up. If you're included in that record, you include it in this record, because if we were talking Paige Pierce elite series plus record, well, now Silva's on a two streak, not a five streak, but that's not the record at, at stake here. So, of course, I'm rooting for her to break the record. I do think that the important thing to look at here is wounded field, quote unquote, still contains two of the top, in my opinion, five, at least top seven FPO players in the world. And it's not like Kristen's over in the U.S. tearing it up and that Silva's over. Kristen's gone. Both fields over here. So if you're going to discredit Silva's wins, you got to discredit Missy's win and Ella's win and Holland's win. And you got to discredit those two, which people aren't doing. So I think it's very unfair to be discrediting Silva's win because both fields are wounded right now. That's a pro tour issue. I'm sure we'll talk about later. Will she get to seven? I think is an important question. If she does, she deserves all the flowers and more because that means that she will have gone through a much more stronger field, including Kristen Tatar at the Crocol Open, and then might as well be a full field at the European Open with a major. To get to seven that's what's ahead of her can she do it absolutely as gary mentioned you know she came into the street going 10th 9th 4th at full fields so who's to say she can't go first first you know when a player gets hot sometimes they stay hot do i think she's going to most likely not but i'm rooting for her yeah certainly one thing to analyze uh analyze things where they are now but like you mentioned if she were to get this record the finished uh finishing stretch is going to be incredibly impressive uh, that's undeniable uh ryan what are your thoughts on uh on this record and um yeah. and what it could mean yeah uh it's impressive absolutely there's there's no doubt about that but that's kind of where i stop with, with agreeing with uh gary and hunter um look i can a lot of people pull off multiple wins in anything whether it's professional sport or backyard cornhole no right? It, it, it is so hard to be consistently good at something. I, I don't disagree with that. I'm not going to discredit her winning. It is really impressive that she is winning. However, I refuse to not notice that her the field of strength that she is playing against is severely wounded. Um, am I rooting for her? Yeah, I guess. I, I mean, I'm a disc golf fan. I want to see better FBO players uh, in the game. So, that standpoint, yes, I am rooting for her because I want more better FBO players, more just better disc golf in general to, to watch. But I'm not going to sit here and say, man, I really hope she beats Paige Pierce's record. Uh, I've always been a Paige fan. Maybe I have some personal bias on that. Um, but if she beats, if, and that's a really big if, if she beats Paige's Page's record, yeah, I think she will have earned it because, as Hunter said, she went out there at European Open, she won. 
I don't think that's going to happen. I, I really don't. I think she's a really good young player. I'm really excited for her potential for the future, but uh, she's been doing this over a weaker field. Is she beating Evelina and Hannah? Yeah, absolutely. But I'd like to see it like Paige did. All right. So Ryan, a little more apprehensive, a little more defensive of Paige Pierce's record. Um, Brody, what do you think? Where do you sit with this one? Yeah. Okay. First thing, Hunter telling me that people aren't discrediting pages and Holland's win. I don't know what you're listening to or what you're looking at. That's the first thing people were doing. Kristen's not there. Let's see if Paige can win against Kristen. So they are discrediting Paige and Holland's wins and they are going to discredit uh, Silva's wins over here. And I actually looked at her wins. Her first two silver wins that he won, she won, she won both by eight. The first one, only uh, she was one of only two players under par. Second one, she was the only player under par. The Turku Open, she won that by two over Evelina, three over Henna. Only four players were under par. Then you go down to the next silver event, she won that by three by shooting five over par. And then you go down to the Swedish Open, the one that she just played, she won that by five over Henna and nine over Ella. Those were the only three players under par. So you can't look at that field and tell me that field's super, super deep. Also, you go back to the last time she was in a field with a much deeper thing that Gary brought up. Yes, that was a uh, Champions Cup. She had a good finish there at fourth. However, that was a wooded course, and that is what her style is really good for, short wooded courses. You go to her last open event that she played at Jonesboro. Yeah, sure, Gary, she did get a top 10 there, but she was 19 shots behind Kristen. Not even the same atmosphere. So this idea of, of like people aren't going to discredit, kind of crazy. Also, I'm not rooting for or rooting against, but I will be tuning in to the Krokol Open where you will have the likes of Tatar, Ella, Paige, and Anakin all there. All right. Lots of digest there. Um, great points there. Um, we got another FPO topic here I'd coming like to up. I'd to bring up two, two just oh, quick rebuttal, points. Oh, rebuttal? Yeah, it's a rebuttal. No, it's yeah, rebuttal. Yeah. Not yeah, yeah. No, it's a rebuttal. It's a rebuttal. Yeah. Go ahead. It's not a rebuttal. It's just uh, <laughs> backing up what Silva's doing in comparison to this. First off, Stat Mando just tweeted this 10 hours ago. Silva Sarnen is... Yeah statistically the number one putter in the world in fpo she's a better putter inside c1x than own scoggins yep. which i think will surprise a lot of people she's disgusting on the putting green also when you're looking I'm at surprised. when page set this record 2017 to 2018 let me just read you this waco field the waco field contained 16 women total okay so first off not very deep there just numbers wise and then it was page beat sarah hokum by one who then had a 10 stroke lead over lisa fakus we had a three-stroke lead of Rebecca Cox. By the time you get to sixth place, which is where Katrina Allen finished, you're 15 strokes out of the lead. It's not like the fields that we're looking at today, even when split, in my opinion, are still stronger than the fields when this record was set. So if we're talking about wounded fields... That's, that's not a good argument. That's not I, a good argument. Because back, back when Paige set the record, everyone knew she was the best player in the world. No one is thinking Silva's the best player in the world right now, even though she has potential of, of, of getting a tie. So... Paige was doing it and she was beating everyone that she could be beating. Silva's doing it right now. And she's not beating everyone that she could be beating. That's the difference. So you can't, you can't make the I argument. It comes I'm just saying if we're, I'm if not, we're talking, I'm we're agreeing talking with you. The field, field that players are doing, then like, I agree. you have to look at the strength of field back then. I and agree. It's not close. It's but not she close. was playing against the page was playing against the best players in the world at that time. Silva sure. is not doing that now. Sure. Hmm. So well, I agree I mean, with you. Emily the field and back then is, is a actually secondary worked. argument as to where you put them in the best players currently. Uh, I think they were only times. in like two of these events, two of these are five events. Yeah, both of the elite ones that Silva's won. But I mean, she the she Turku won and the, the Swedish is the important part. Like, yeah, she's beating everyone that's in front of her, Certainly. and that's all she can do. Oh, so like, go I back and check the tape. Back, uh, I can't remember what the course was. It was the where they had college nationals, Boulder, the Boulder course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I'm pretty Coast. sure. I don't know if it was on debate night or tour. I don't know what it was on, but I'm pretty sure I brought her name up saying like, I saw her on the putting green and she has the best putt in FPO. No one knew who she was at the time because she hadn't done much. Uh, so yeah. I'm not surprised at all. It's yeah. just, well, also, she's got to figure out how to throw the disc farther. Currently, I mean, she, Evelina Solonen is the number one ranked player in the world statistically with points. She's but the best player in the world. Real quick, real last thing. You look at someone like a Valerie, and I know Valerie has has been injured and whatnot, but you look at like a Valerie Manahano or Alexis Manahano, like at a certain point in time, we were thinking that they were one of the top players and could potentially contend. They have not figured out how to throw the disc farther. And by that, they've kind of fallen off. So yeah. Silva has to figure out a way of throwing the disc farther. 
it's become it's definitely become a, a barrier that you know certain players like Owen Scoggins have been able to overcome it at, at the at choice events. But she but still kind of throws far though with that flex she, line. Yeah, she can get like some sneaky. she gets some distance, but at, um, it definitely is 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 a barrier for for more players in FPO. You don't see that as much in MPO players being completely blocked out from distance. Owen's also um, like a robot. She like doesn't really make that many mistakes. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's um. No matter how you look at it, though, it's obviously an impressive streak. Anytime you can just continue winning wherever you're at, um, it, it's something to look at. We've got another fan submitted topic next. This one a little more controversial. Um, we've talked about this in, in ways before, but I want to get everybody's takes on this. So, this this fan submitted. When is it time for the DG uh, PT to separate from the FPO? One MPO tour, then a separate FPO tour. The DG PT should be spending the most time, energy, and effort on the area that brings the most value. If you watch an NBA game, you don't have to sit through a WNBA game. If you watch tennis, you don't have to watch everyone play in all divisions. The list goes on. So when is it time that on the pro level, we separate out tours? Hunter. I think I think this is a good question and something that should be asked pretty frequently because it is something that needs to eventually happen um, because this would actually drastically benefit both tours. Right now, we have to find courses and find locations that can host both fields, right? And on the MPO side, sometimes we even have to cut the field to make room for FPO for playing the same course. Up to this point, FPO hasn't got big enough that that's a problem by the other way, but where I do think it's holding FPO back is in the course designs that they're forced to play because a lot of times you have the MPO course is the main feature, the main focus of the course design, and the FPO is sometimes a byproduct. Even just some of the players' needs in general, when they're not the main focus of the weekend, they're the ones that suffer. But now is not the time. Um, my opinion for this is mainly because I don't think the Pro Tour can sustain both tours. I think that both tours would drastically struggle logistically if you separated them i also think that so many players the way they're able to survive is they tour together so you have several couples that are touring that's not something that necessarily is the pro tours thing to worry about but when we're talking about the nba and wnba we're talking about tennis we're talking about golf those are so well established that they can survive both or at least have one be so successful it can supplement the other we're not there if you separate both tours one's gonna die and unfortunately popularity wise that will be the fpo tour so if we were to separate the tour right now it would be the end of fpo in my opinion or at least fpo as we know it i think that instead of the numbers of pros going up it would go down so i think this the sport needs to grow quite a bit more as a whole and then it's a good idea to have this happen okay okay um ryan do you have a similar opinion or or maybe something yeah. different oh yeah all right so when when should have this happened i, I think back in 2021 2022 if we were going to even attempt it we're beyond that. The The money is no longer there to, to make this happen. The boom of COVID disc golf was maybe our, our only shot thus far. Uh, what the FPO needs and it doesn't quite have yet is, is it needs that star studded cast. You, you use the WNBA as an example, right? WNBA was not being watched. It was barely an afterthought when it came to basketball. But with Caitlin Clark and the star-studded rookie class, right? WNBA is, has actually gained some popularity because of them. We have Kristen Tatar. But beyond that, we just don't have the star-studded cast to make the FPO its own tour to build a, a true tour around yet. I think we're waiting for the development of the FPO still when it comes to skill and just star studdedness that we can get money influence into a tour for them. I agree with Hunter without the MPO supplementing the FPO, which it can't do yet. I don't think we're ready yet. Uh, and, and that's what as of right now, it would have to be think back to when Ricky and Paul uh, for five to seven years, I mean, they dominated the MPO. They carried the MPO. So many people tuned in because of Ricky and Paul. We need that for the FPO. We need to build that hype that that people are going to say, man, I can't wait to watch blah, 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 of FPO at this separate tournament. I'm going to go to that turn because I want to see these star studded FPO players. We're not there yet. Um, we just don't have enough resources to put behind them. I, yeah, it stinks. I, I wish we could, but we're not there yet. I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt the, the WNBA found kind of a winning recipe this year. And um, you're kind of on the right track. We're like, we have Kristen, and I think that's gotten people to tune in to watch Kristen. But if we had one more player like Kristen and they could tune in for a duel between those two players and we could really feed yes. into that rivalry, that could be that could be the cherry on top that it needs. Um, Brody, what do you think? 
Yeah, first thing is, you know, you send over these questions and uh, I immediately like de delete all the fluff out just so I have the question. So I don't know if you actually put fan question. You sometimes do. I don't know if this one did. I'm glad you said it was a fan question because I was actually worried that you were maybe unfit for your job. Me and Hunter are completely different. This is the worst question that has ever been asked on the show. <laughs> this is the worst question that's ever been asked on the show. First off, let me just break down your question. Everything that you not just my said, question. <laughs> no, not your question. Whoever said this in, everything that he said in the question, which no one's talked about so far, which I think is crazy, you can pick and choose what you want to watch. If I don't want to watch any tennis matches, guess what? I don't have to watch any ten tennis matches. If I don't want to watch any, I'm talking about female tennis matches. If I don't want to watch the WNBA, I don't have to watch the WNBA. Guess, guess what else you could do? You could also sleep in until two o'clock and not watch any FPO. There's nothing forcing you to watch FPO right now. It is literally just a bonus right now for those that, if you're like, I only want to watch F MPO. Oh, but FPO is actually on. Maybe I'll tune in. Or, oh, I'll go to the course a little bit earlier and see it. I actually think, hear me out, I actually think that if golf didn't take five-plus hours to play and they didn't have over 130 people in their field, I actually think this would be smart for golf. Have the ladies go out in the morning, have the men go out in the afternoon. That could be very electric. I would like to see that. Wow. That might be the first time I in, do, in human history to... that Brody has suggested a disc golf thing be carried over to golf. Never yeah. before. I I never before. Say, with, with, Tennis with, this is question, with this question, if anyone, was gonna, for inclusion. if anyone was going to say a way not to watch FPO, it would be Brody. That does make the most sense. <laughs> he, he knows how to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Known FPO watcher. Well, here's Smith. the thing. If you break up the tours, we'll definitely know who's not going to watch FPO. That's, That's true. true. Mm -hmm. No excuse at that point. Um, you wouldn't even know the course <laughs> if you hadn't, if you didn't go watch it. Uh, Gary, wrap it up for us. What are your thoughts on this uh, proposal? Is it as preposterous as Brody says? Brody makes a really great point, though, that you can just watch whatever you want. But we'll go down the thought experiment of potentially separating MPO and FBO. I think there are some positives to the idea, but there's some very obvious negatives. Um, between both divisions, though, the FBO does have the larger growth opportunity for the sport. If you look at the, the attendance in the 1990 Worlds, there was 0 0.089 women for every one man. Uh, and at the 2023 Worlds, there was 0 0.361 women for every um, one man. That's a 300 percent improvement. Uh, to the growth of the sport there but keeping the event separate allows for things like more room for the fpo participation by ex you know expanding the field you're going to get courses and layouts that are more appropriate for the fpo and a great example of this is if you look at ledgestone where mpo plays eureka temp and the fpo plays sunset hills which is more appropriate for their skill level and distance requirements and tea times will feel less crammed into one part of the day uh, for them but there are some obvious obvious issues that have to be think thought about when we go down this line. Number one is resources. Resources are a huge deal. How on earth is the tour going to be able to almost double its staff and its cameras? And if you can say they can take some of the cameras and send them over there, nope. If we have more cameras, we want more cameras on, on MPO to get more cards. Um, scheduling is a massive issue. If they're going to play on the same weekend, what courses are you going to use? And how is it fair that the FPO doesn't get to play on the course with established history? So how do you even figure out scheduling? And the biggest problem is viewership splitting. The diehards will watch FPO, but you're splitting off your audience. And we already talked about this issue with Europe, so why would you add a third problem to the mix? I think as the tour expands and the FPO grows, like Hunter said, we should revisit this every couple of years, but I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah. I, I, I think... do a quick rebuttal. Yeah. I, I think it's more, instead of, instead of the idea of the MPO kicking the FPO away, I think it's more going to be the FPO is kicking the MPO away. The FPO is mm. getting so popular, so big mm. that they're like, yes. we feel like we can't continue to grow because the MPO is in our way. Yeah, That, I think, is what needs to happen for the split. Mm -hmm. Because you go out right now and you go to a, a women's professional tennis match, you go out and you watch a women's professional uh, golf tournament, there aren't people in the field that you look at and go, what? What? If you split right now and opened up the field to 100 plus women, there would be people in the field that people would look at and go, What? <laughs> That's not good. We can't have the what? Brody, I got, yeah, it's a very funny way, but I got a question for you then, Brody. So, with golf, if you were, you're saying like maybe they should continue to bring them together, how would you attack the disc golf course design issue that we are inevitably running into where FPO just ends up playing courses that are just not so meant for them? But golf is so much easier because you just move the tee pads. 
Yeah, but I'm saying, how would you attack that in disc golf? Like, if, if this is the long-term play, oh. how do we solve that problem? Oh, no, no. I don't think the long-term play is for them to play together. Okay. Because I because I think, essentially, you, you would get to the point of where the FPO would be so big where they're like, why are we pin- pigeonholed at only 40 players? Yeah. That makes you sense. know? Um, and, I mean, heck, if you, if you had crazy amounts of crowds, that would be insane, too. But Because yeah. uh, that, at the end of the day, too, if you, you, you don't want to have a set situation where you're like, hey, we can have this event over here and sell that event out, and we can have this event yes. over here and sell that event out. Correct. Or we just have them at the same and we sell half the tickets, which yeah. we do. You're right. And, 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 yeah, like if FPO got big enough to where they could say, well – why not have an event on this side of the country and we're making money off of this and it's not going to change the revenue that we're making from the MPO event as well. It's, it's about doubling up there. Um, okay. We got one final topic. I think this one will be quite interesting to get everybody's takes on uh, very interesting. I think it's one of the most interesting stories that's broken in disc golf uh, recently, as far as, as far as I'm concerned. So when Vino Makala left prodigy with time left on his deal uh, recently, we assumed it was similar to the KJ situation. Um, just prodigy looking to dump some payroll uh, for, of some cap space, whatever it might be. However, a new Finnish interview with Vino alludes to the idea that he may have signed a four-year deal worth a similar amount to his previous contract, which we are assuming was one of a, of a decent value. So I just want to know, are you buying this? You know, is this, are you even thinking that that could be true? Or is this, maybe is this just uh, a twisting of the words for marketing's sake? Um, and if you are buying it, what would Innova's motivation be to make such a commitment? Because um, I think this was just kind of unexpected, and in, in, in my opinion, at least. Uh, uh, Ryan, what are your thoughts? I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it one bit. It's marketing 100%. Nobody's going to be over here saying, oh my goodness, I just got dropped from Prodigy, which I'm going to be on that train. I, I think you got dropped from Prodigy. And I signed this massive, huge, lucrative deal with Innova. I, I think he's going to make the situation seem better than it was. Do I think Innova gave him money? Yeah, I I, I do. And I think this is, is a change in Innova. My guess is that Innova is starting to realize that their team isn't quite adequate enough to move plastic like it once was. We talked about this two, three years ago. What is Innova doing? They're letting everybody go. Maybe they finally started to realize, hey, we probably shouldn't have let everyone go. We've got Calvin. We've got a good like core team, but we don't have what we used to have. I mean, look at Discraft. Look at what Dismania has done with just their core Sky team, right? Maybe Innova is starting to think, hey, one area we can expand in is the European market, which Vino has a lot of pull in, right? If we get Vino, now we're pushing more into the European market. We can start heading over there. I I still think Prodigy dumped him because they were paying him too much or they couldn't make the finances work. I still think it was part of the KJ deal, but I... <laughs> I I don't know. Innova's been the Ebenezer Scrooge of disc golf for, it seems like, a decade now. Why are they all of a sudden paying money to to KJ and Vino? I, I'm confused by it. Yeah, definitely seems like a bit of an out-of-character move. Um, the Ebenezer Scrooge, I like that. Uh, Brody, what are you making of this latest transaction? Uh, why can't both be true here? Why, why can't Prodigy have dropped him and said, hey, we don't want to fulfill the rest of this contract and why can't Innova have paid him a decent amount or more? Um, I think w- the, the big thing here is Innova not having Dismania under their, their umbrella. They don't have that much of a, a presence anymore in the European market. And I know I heard you guys talking a little bit about it on grip lock today. Vino is massive in Europe. Like, to the point of where he not just not just he shows up to a disc golf course and everyone knows who he is like he will he will get spotted and and stopped in the streets like that's not normal here in the states for disc golf no one has any idea except for that one time we went to that ice cream place um outside of that no one has any idea who these people are if they're not on the disc golf course vinyl's a big deal and i don't think a lot of people in the states understand that so him going to Innova and him getting a big contract is not surprising to me, especially if they are trying to make a bigger push in that market. Um, now, are, c- could he be massaging some of the numbers? Potentially, potentially. But, uh, <laughs> but I could totally see both of these instances being true. 
Okay, massaging the numbers. That's that's the word from Brody Smith. <laughs> um, Gary, what do you think about Vino? Are you are are you buying this? You know, looking at the situation, it definitely appears like Vino wanted a change. In an interview that came out on the 25th, earlier than the interview we talked about, um, he said that he's been thinking about this change since December of 2023, and he started the process. Um, and when asked about it, he said it caused him a lot of distress during the first half of the year, and he said he lost his childlike passion for playing, and that's something he wanted to go back to, which is why going back to his roots with Innova is great for him. I did find it odd, though, they didn't put him on the star team since they do lack a male European player on the star team, and he brings more to the table than some of the people on that team. Um, so I could certainly see the 125 to 140 euros being a realistic thing because, uh, like we talked about, Vino has a massive presence in, in European disc golf, and he's just a European icon. Um, he also brings more YouTube subscribers than the entire rest of Team Innova combined. Um, the only YouTube account that has more is uh, Innova's YouTube account. Uh, he's also the only European player on their team using YouTube. He has a 51,000 Instagram followers, which makes him the sixth best on the team already. Um, I think Innova's making a solid play here with this four-year deal because this is a big break for them into the European market that they don't really have the greatest presence in. Vino is only 25 years old, so this could last a good while for them. And Innova has one of the weakest social media presences of all the top manufacturing companies. So this helps fixes that. When you add in both Vino and the KJ thing, they both bring 125,000 Instagram followers and almost 80,000 YouTube subscribers to the mix. So I think that Innova made a calculated decision here. It's just another example of them sitting back making a move on the chessboard, watching the other manufacturers play chess or, yeah. or checkers. Mm, yeah, no, definitely could be uh just could just be a marketing pivot for Innova, maybe, maybe turning a new leaf uh, in their business strategy. Um, Hunter, how are you digesting this? What do you think is going on with Vino? Well, I think that the thing that's holding a lot of people up is that we assume that Kevin Jones deal and the Vino deal are intertwined and are being treated the same from both platforms. Something to remember is <clears throat> that Prodigy Europe is a separate company completely separate. When, even when Kale was giving us information, he was like, I'm not really privy to much information about Vino, but I think it's about the same thing. So I think what Brody said is kind of hitting the nail on the head where it's probably something where it is an issue with Prodigy, where they're like, hey, we can't keep this on the payroll anymore. But it was like chomping at the bit for Vino, but chomping at the bit for Vino doesn't necessarily mean they're doing the same for KJ. I think that both can be true in that case. So I think that's why some people are having a harder time believing this because Vino is a big deal. If you remember, Vino Makala's YouTube channel is the reason we were like, should we be translating foundation videos into Finnish? Mm -hmm. And then we reached out to a voice actor and he said, everyone in Finland speaks English. Don't pay me. And I said, okay, <laughs> okay, okay, well, at least at least we went down that road. But the, his YouTube channel is the reason for that. And so they could be looking at this because losing Discmania is a huge hit to the European market for Innova. This is a huge bump. So, you know, Tony... Uh, this is actually a Foundation Nation. They put this in Foundation Nation, but this guy, Tony Sirjanen, is apparently a disc golf commentator over there, one of the most respected disc golf experts in Finland. He was saying that previously with Prodigy, Vino's income was around 125,000 euros a year. It is now expected to be 130 to 150,000 euros, um, which for me, I think if I'm Innova and I'm looking at what he can do off the course and I'm looking at his popularity, that could be definitely something I'm willing to do. I think why it seems so stunning is we're just tying it to Kevin Jones and we really don't think any of us doing the same for him over here. Um, yeah, my, so my, my thing is, and like, cause I hear you guys saying like, why can't both things be true? What? <laughs> he saw the him? points. He saw the point update. Oh uh, man. Oh, we have point watchers. This is a strong show tonight, oh, boys. No, it's a strong show tonight, boys. Very That's strong. That's why it's nice. You can't see, when you can't see your points, you don't even have to look for it's them. It's very strong <laughs> show. Um, <laughs> Brody, you're getting the lightest shade of yellow next year. Um, here's the thing. <laughs> it goes back to Brody's uh, house metaphor last last episode or whenever that was. I I agree. You know, if you look at the Vino deal at face value, had this deal ended with Prodigy in normal fashion and him being a free agent, yes, he he brings European uh, popularity. He brings that social media value. However, my question is, was there a bidding war? Because if he goes to the market being essentially let go of his contract, um, you know, what just what were the terms of the deal? Because was Innova not thinking, you know, were they just acting in goodwill being like, yeah, we'll match or even raise your contract? Or were they not thinking, well, yeah, we can definitely scoop in under under what he was getting paid because there, Prodigy's there not there been, for him anymore. There could have been a bidding war because, again, yeah, that, we, yeah, right. our That's source a, is from Prodigy USA. Right. That's right? the he biggest question said, for me. I don't know about Prodigy I, Europe. I feel so like I think there the had to be cause is similar, but I think the end result is different. And it's the timing yeah. that makes us think it was all part of one deal. Yeah. So I, think I, I feel like there had to be a competitive or, bid. Maybe MVP. Thing, 
maybe it was a whole let's package all the whole negotiation right and yeah. they're giving kevin jones so little that they can give vino so <laughs> it was much. a buy one get maybe one free thing maybe it's like hey well you know we're getting two guys that could be star caliber we're basically yeah. averaging 80 grand a year this is great maybe that's it was, why it it was mogo kj Ma- I, I maybe it was the only one that had free cap it'd be that too it yeah. could be just be no one wants them the increased I, I price say, tag i don't know if i'm buying the that Vino starting this in December. That's the part where I feel like that's like the marketing spin yeah. of, well, hey, I want I want that to be like a good move for out just be only because of the timing with the Kevin Jones deal. Yeah. That's the, that's oh, the you're thing. talking about he's been working out the deal. Yeah, like he six, started this back in December, right. and it's been that's the only part that I'm like, ah, eh. if I hadn't seen the Kevin Jones deal, sure, I'm buying it 100. percent But like with both of them happening at the same time, makes me go like, which is also how we marketing spin zone. Did we figure out whether that's illegal or not? It's, I, there's no laws. There's, there's no like. Brody wants to make sure just, that nobody's breaking the law. Are you sure? Like, if you sign, just cut contractually. The best I'm saying, you can't yeah. put that into the contract of like, hey, once we sign you, you can't talk to other manufacturers about leaving. It might, yeah, you probably could have. Yeah, you like, can put it. All depends if it's in the contract. Right or not. There. Okay. That's, yeah. that's not, wasn't, I'm not saying there's a federal law that's not allowing yeah. you. I'm saying, wouldn't you want that in your contract of like, hey, once we sign you, we don't want you two months later being like, hey, guys, these guys, I just won. And these guys are only like are only paying me $100,000. Can you do any better than that? Like, I feel like you yeah. don't want people well, to be allowed to do that. Wasn't Vino's contract almost over to begin with? I, I yeah. feel like anyone who's about to end a contract definitely starts the negotiation and thought process early that's enough. Six months. I think um, he had the, I think his original deal it, um, was through like 2026. I thought he had there another are, one. On it. Well, there are rules you on this sort of thing. Yes, like in uh, in soccer, once you have six months or maybe 12 months, either 12 or six months left on your deal, you can start negotiating a deal mm-hmm. and even sign a deal to where when your contract ends, your next one just begins. I don't like that. <laughs> Hates it. Loyalty well, is everything. Well, you hate that too. If you're like star player on your favorite team, you got to take care of your boys. You got to extend them. Yeah, well, they've already, know, uh, they're already yeah, signed. They're they're already out the door. They don't it's, care. It's for, it's for the company too, though, because if they want to, if they know they have cap space incoming, they can also then make moves on their end. So letting a player go ahead and check out and look beforehand gives them the ability to make moves on their own. So Wild 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 deal was through 2026. He oh, still yeah. had. There you go. Year, yeah. next year in the final following. Yeah. Lock him up. Never. You can never play. Too deal. early, can never plan too early, guys. That's right. At Brody, if you get if you get the two years left girl. on your deal, you need another four year extension. That's how Brody. <laughs> that's how Brody operates. <laughs> Do we have manufacturer collusion? Contact your local oh. counselor. Right? Should 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 we be upset? I, I tried to say. I, I tried are... to say that last time. No one like no one liked that thought. Oh really? Man, yeah, I, 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 I like the thought. Make, I was just saying. We need to get this in front of a judge. I do now. Like I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of someone like state representative. <laughs> well, because that, right that, right that that heart that happens in like the sports cards, and I hate it. There's Not like to, buddy busty buddy systems where they're like they just give it out to their buddies, and then no one else has anything. Dang it, man! I don't like it because we all know players changing contracts increases yeah. their value. Certainly. So yeah. wouldn't mm-hmm. it make sense if you had a trifecta to just do a little uh, ropey dope? Could have been a ropey dope. Just a little said, every couple it. years, like we'll take them, then you take them, then he takes them. Could be been the yeah. whole ropey dope. It's, it's just the coaching carousel. Um, all right, yeah. we're going into the finals here. Hunter and Brody all tied up. Um, Hunter, I think you have the most recent win, so I'll ask you if you want to go first or second. There's that bias, man. Uh, I was gonna say this should be a fair battle because me and Hunter are both reading the question for the first time. Give me you first. Go first. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm excited very, to hear this one. I'm very interesting to hear answers for this. Um, I'm going to really scrutinize these scores. So here's my question, because this is really puzzling me. Why do you think the Pro Tour is sacrificing a coherent schedule in order to squeeze in as many European events as possible? Are their motivations purely in goodwill towards the European scene, or could they have a monetary angle that would better explain such a focus on a tour that during events on U.S. soil? What is going on? Why are they driving these events into the schedule wherever they can? What is their angle? What's going on, Hunter? Uh, in my opinion, I don't think there's any, I would be shocked if it was purely goodwill towards the European scene, mainly because you can accomplish that with a completely different schedule. Like that you don't have to have these going. It's actually almost hurting the European scene by not letting the top pros get over there because then it's making people chirp at the European event saying, 
oh, well, it wasn't a full field because Gannon's still back playing Des Moines this weekend. And then Des Moines is now going to be like, oh, it's not a full field. You have Calvin and Ricky. So, like, you're hurting yourself. So, I don't think it's purely goodwill. I think it has to be monetary. So, in my opinion, I think that what makes the most sense to me, I don't have any insider information. It just logically what checks all the boxes is disc golf in Europe is like just bigger than disc golf in the u.s when you go player per capita courses per capita stuff like that like it's just a bigger sport feeling over there so i think the pro tour kind of got scared of the european pro tour saw it taking off and was like we have the opportunity right now to come in and become the overarching place that has both tours and i think in that negotiation process the european tour was like well we've already got this all set up we need things to go certain ways for this deal to go through and the Pro Tour needed control, and they were willing to sacrifice a coherent schedule to gain control. That's my opinion as to why things look the way they look, because every other option, there's ways around it. Like, if it's like, oh, we're just trying to form one coherent tour, well, then why are we doing things where you have events going on? You're doing a simulcast this weekend, right? Not a Simon cast. That's sick. Hmm. Simulcast, where there's two events going on at the same time. Like, why are we doing stuff like that? if we're genuinely trying to push the product to as many eyes as possible and make the product as good as possible, then these decisions don't make sense. These decisions only make sense if we have some other motive behind it. So that's my opinion is I think that those were kind of the contract negotiation terms that came to, to allow the pro tour to have control. They sacrifice the schedule. I, um, yeah, I think this is a strong argument. Um, I, I definitely, we, what have we seen in the past? You know, we've seen disc golf organizations, especially big overarching ones want control of anything big that happens in disc golf, 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 PDGA. Um, so I think this is a strong argument. This is definitely one that makes sense for me. We'll see what Brody brings to the table. Um, what do you got Brody? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a puzzling one because from the player side of things, if I'm a European player right now, it's making me not feel like I need to go as much to the States as I would have maybe in the past. And we're seeing that, right? We're seeing certain players stay over there uh, more than they, they did in the past. And then vice versa, same thing of where now players, yeah, we're seeing some people go over there and play a couple of events here and there, but you, you have to pick and choose a couple of years ago. It was not a pick and choose. It was, I'm going to play all these events and then I'm going to go over and play the two, uh, the European Open, and then come back. And then it was I'm going to play all these events, and then I'm going to go over a week early, play this tournament, Sula, and then play the European Open and come back. And I felt like they should have just kept with that and just kept adding. Okay, now now you come over a week before the European Open and you stay a week after, and instead of doing this thing where now players are like, I mean, no one no one's doing it. No one no one is back and forth flying. You're picking one or the other now. I kind of agree with Hunter here. I do think sometimes, and we've seen it with a lot of companies in disc golf, not just the pro tour, they get a little bit out in front of their skis. They get a little, they, they get a little feeling themselves and they start going a little bit fast. And then they're like, Holy crap, what's going on? Um, I mean that you look at some of the people that the disc golf pro tour or the disc golf network hired where they're hiring like a natural, uh, a nature person, or I don't even know what that was. I don't know if they were paying them, but they were, I think they were on the payroll. Um, shout out to Madison Walker. But still, it's like, do we really need that right now? I'll look at it this way. You look at like the NFL, right? Look what the NFL is doing. They're waiting until things – I mean, they have so many games on Sunday, but that's not enough. Let's add a game on Monday. But no, let's add two games on Monday. Let's add a game on Thursday. Let's add two games on Thursday. They have so many people watching – that they can continue to add and be like, we're still getting crazy numbers. I don't know if that's the play here with disc golf. I don't know if the play is let's just continue to add and add and add. I think the play is let's try to get as many people to watch one thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm as confused as anybody. I, but at the end of the day, I do think, yeah, I think Hunter's point is the strongest. I think the play is to give him the win today. Congratulations, Hunter. You're a winner. Strong show tonight. Very Thank good you. performances from everybody all around. Um, good effort. Um, what do you have to say, Hunter? And is it about the ace Because if not, don't say it. It is about the ace Yeah, all I was going to say is that Trevor and I's brains are kind of combined after what we went through getting our ace We're trauma aces. bonded. Yeah, we're trauma bonded after everything we went through. We're also, you know, you can get your ace discs on Friday, July 5th, 5 p.m. Eastern time, foundationdiscs.com. And then... <laughs> 
you know, you can watch while you're waiting in anticipation. You can watch our suffering from our failure to get aces on Monday, July 8th, in the middle of the workday when we're trying to hit 46 consecutive putts. Um, cause that's just going to not, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So you'll have hours and hours of entertainment there. So kind of a one, two hit, but you know, all that, all this time we're spending together just makes Trevor and I's brain think too similar. That's why I'm here. Wait, what hole were you guys trying? We were rotating through just several holes. It, was, it took us three hours. Yeah, we eventually. Oh, it wasn't wait, the, are you saying now what happened the, yesterday? Wasn't off the, the camera? camera um, what happened yesterday that no one saw was three hours of pain and torture at hole three. With is seven that the infamous outs. hole? That's the infamous hole. Yeah. Mm. The basket you did not want to catch the prison. Well, hole's got some juju, man. Well, I aced it. The basket just didn't accept it. Did you see the clip <laughs> on Instagram? Mm. Uh, no, I saw the one that you aced. Yeah, well, maybe yeah, well, maybe the watch today. the newest one. It's um, it's oh, pretty, I haven't been on my phone. Much. It's pretty tough watch. Yeah. <laughs> it was, and that's one of seven. I'm not going to say what was basket. It a backhand? Yeah, I'm not going to say what basket it was. I will but, say um, in the video, there's two of the same basket, and one does a phenomenal catch it shouldn't have caught, and yeah. the other does an awful spit out it should have caught. It was uh, it was something. the same basket. Anyways, like, they're, they're, they're the same baskets. Yeah. Um, if you enjoyed yeah. this episode, uh, make sure to like and leave some comments down below. Um, and if you want to submit a topic for next week's episode, make sure to do so by scanning the QR code here on the screen or clicking the link in the description. Um, obviously, we did have some uh, fan submitted questions this week. If the QR code is going to come up on the screen, Silas. So you can't get it. Links in the description, though. Links in the description. Shout out our boy Silas. He fights. He's a fighter. Um, <laughs> link is in the description. I'm sure that's what most of you use anyways because you're watching on your phone. Make sure to submit those topics. Um, you may even have your question called the worst ever asked in the history of the show by Brody Smith. And that is... Um, to be fair, though, Hunter did deal. say this was a good question. So it kind of balanced it out. It balances out. One person said it was a good agreeing. question. One he also, person... <laughs> he also ended up agreeing with the question. And I like asked him. He was like, well, I do think we should eventually do it. That's true. He did eventually oh, land on that. A little confusing there. I was kinda... It was more so the tone Wait, of who the... Agreed? Uh, no, he did. what he didn't agree with was the tone of like the, no, I he shouldn't was have claiming, to watch this yeah. thing. Yeah, he yeah. was saying all this stuff. Like No one, yeah. no one's forcing you uh, to do that. Essence no one's of the question was great though. 10 out of 10 essence. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> hopefully you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you next time. <laughs>